The ecstasy scene or business in the uh, in the late 90s was allegedly, I always say allegedly, ran by Sammy DeBull Gravano out of Phoenix, Arizona, and a guy by the name of Sean Atwood. He was originally from England. And you know, Sean describes a story. They're all in a room, him and all his accomplices, uh, Wild Men and Acid Joe and guys like that, and they're all in a room, and uh, they're doing some smack or whatever the heck they're doing. And a cop happens to smell marijuana, he says, and he comes into the door of the house and he says, all of you are under arrest. And some guy with long hand, allegedly Mexican mafia, pulls out a gun, points it in the cop's face and said, the only one that's not leaving this room is you. Hey everybody, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody's doing well. And I got a good one for you today. Uh, it's a story of Sean Atwood. Now, how would I describe this? It's kind of like the Wolf of Wall Street meets the English guy. Fascinating story. A stockbroker gets involved in the ecstasy business uh, in a big way, something that I'm familiar with, not because I was in the business, but because I was impacted by it in a way, and I'll get into that. But it's a great story. Uh, Sean is a fascinating character. He's had, uh, you know, entanglement with uh, Sammy Gravano's crew uh, out in Arizona, involved in this whole ecstasy uh, business, and it's, uh, it's going to be something you're really going to enjoy. So we're going to get into that. But before we do that, michaelfrancis.com. The community is growing. I would advise you, please, to go on michaelfrancis.com right now and look at getting involved in the crew. I mean, I, I really mean it. You're going to enjoy it. We're putting a lot of great content in there. There's a lot more involvement with me. We're doing Zoom calls twice a month. Uh, we're answering a lot of questions. We're giving a lot of insight, a lot of life lessons, a lot of business lessons. You know, coming out of this pandemic, a lot of people are encouraging one another. I think it's something that's going to be good. It's an extension of what I've been doing for 25 years, going around the world, sharing my stories, talking with people, trying to encourage them, give them insight. A couple other things, the TV series, we've gotten the pilot. I've read it. It's terrific. It's terrific. I'm really excited about it. And again, for those of you that are in my inner uh, circle, in my crew, you're going to get, you know, advanced knowledge of this. And we're going to be giving you things that other people are not going to be getting right away. So, you know, join that uh, crew. And this is another advantage that's coming your way. Mafia Democracy, my next book. People keep asking me, where can I buy it? It's not out yet. We're not releasing it until the summer. But you're going to enjoy it. It's going to give you some real insight into how our government is operating today. More bomb-like than ever before. Trust me on that. So those are all the good things coming up. But now let's get into Sean Atwood's story. Fascinating. Sean, it's a pleasure to have you on. Sean Atwood, you have a, uh, I would say, an illustrious career, done a lot of different things. You're now in the United Kingdom where you have a huge following. You know, people uh, enjoy listening to you on YouTube and, and uh, you know, in every other space that you're on. I'd like to get into this sit down and just talk about some things. You know, we have some things in common. We both spent time in prison. We both did the wrong thing at one point in time, and now we're doing the right things together. At least we, we certainly appear to be trying to do that. We've both reached a couple of milestones in our lives. So with that, let's start out with you. I know I got to get back to this a little bit. You're a very intelligent guy. You know, I read up on you, watched your interviews. You carry yourself well, conduct yourself well. You know, you, you were brilliant in your dealings in the stock market from a young age up. Why don't you tell us just a little bit about that so people understand, you know, my view is at least who you are and, and, uh, and where you came from. Yeah. So as a kid in the 80s, I watched that movie, Wall Street, Greed is Good. And it resonated because I'm from a small chemical manufacturing town in the industrial northwest of England, in between Liverpool and Manchester. So growing up, didn't have much money. Watching Wall Street, absolutely dazzled by the lifestyle of the corporate raider, Gordon Gecko. And greed is good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in school. I had an economics teacher called Mr. Dillon and only a handful of us chose economics. Nobody was interested in it. He saw I had a particular aptitude. So he started giving me classes on my own 
Now, here in the UK, you've got this publication called the Financial Times. It's like a pink newspaper. And Mr. Dillon is flicking through the Financial Times, showing me all the stock market numbers, you know, the days high, low, P ratio, dividend, year high, year low, and telling me what all that means. So I've got this manic energy. If I'm enthusiastic about something, I throw this manic energy into it. Went down the library, ordered dozens of books on the subject, and I quickly learned that it wasn't just a mathematical phenomenon. It was psychology, crowd psychology in particular. So as a kid, I was reading books like Le Bon, The Crowd, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. And all this stuff was sinking in. Now, at 16 years old, I wanted to invest. Margaret Thatcher, she was privatizing British telecom shares in this country. So I went to my parents for money. Now, my parents were Labour supporters. So you guys have got, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats. Labour are for, they were supporting back then the miners who were striking. I know some Americans might look at it as socialism or whatever. Mm -hmm. But my parents were hardcore Labour supporters. So when I went to them for money to invest in a Margaret Thatcher privatization, they were like, bugger off. We're not <laughs> Tories. We're not conservatives like your nan. So a light bulb went off over my head, my nan. Now, on Sundays, I would eat Sunday dinner at my parents' house. And I was so ravenous as a teenager. I'd run down to my nan's and eat another Sunday dinner down there. So after my second Sunday dinner, I popped my nan the question, hey, nan, can you lend me 50 quid, 50 pounds, probably about $70, $80 back then, to invest in British Telecom in the stock market? Sure. So she gives me the money. It doubles on the first day of dealings, and I was hooked from that age. And let me ask you this. What, what did your parents think when you, when you uh, doubled your grandmother's money? <laughs> did they want in at that point? <laughs> they wanted in on the action, and Margaret Thatcher started to privatize the British gas. Um, I think it was British Steel, all the different water companies. So over the years, as I went into university, I had all my family members on board, we had accounts in everybody's names. We were thinking about opening accounts in the pet dog's name at one point just to get in on these privatizations because each person who applied definitely got an allocation, even if it was a small allocation. So it was in your interest to do as many applications as possible. So by the end of it, they were right in there with me, yes. <laughs> I figured that. Uh, Sean, let me, let me ask you this. You're a legitimate guy. You're doing everything in business legitimately. But did you start to think in your mind, you know, how do I cut corners? How do I capitalize on this? How do I pay less tax? You know, did you start to think and maneuver? The reason I ask you that, because I started out legit all, also. And then for some reason, you know, things come into your head. Hey, I think I can more, make more if I do it this way. I don't know if I want to pay this tax. I don't know if some of us are just inclined to think that way. Uh, and some of us are just straight. No, we're not going to do that. You know, like uh, we're going to keep everything straight. We're going to play by the book. What was your, uh, you know, how did you maneuver and how did you turn? OK, so as a kid, I wasn't thinking about tax considerations, but I did go into gray areas of the law. So, for example, when I graduated from Liverpool University, I had visited Arizona as a teen. I was dazzled. People rolled out the red carpet, particularly the women when they heard the English accent. So I'm thinking, I want some of that after I graduate. So didn't think twice about getting a work visa. Mm -hmm. Jumped on the plane with my student credit cards. And I had an aunt who, she actually had changed my date of birth in my passport when I was 16, so I was 21, took me out nightclubbing in Arizona to Zazu's nightclub on Camelback Road. And she's introduced me to all these beautiful American women as Paul McCartney's nephew. Mm -hmm. So, you know, document um, forgery was not out of my realm. So with my aunt, we schemed whereby, as I'm applying for these jobs as a stockbroker in Phoenix, if anyone asks my work visa, we're just going to go to the office depot, whatever it is, get a printing set, stamp H1B1 visa in my passport. <laughs> you know, in my mind, it was like, fuck, I'll be fucked in the business world. Gordon Gecko, greed is good is my mantra. I'm here to conquer, you know, the stock market. Nothing is going to get in my way. So you're kind of, 
you're kind of predisposed to doing that kind of stuff. And, you know, so is I. I mean, I'll be honest with you. You know, when I was in business, I was looking to cut corners. Um, I don't know where my moral compass was at that point. I wasn't looking to do hardcore bad things, but, you know, cutting corners to, to get ahead. Um, whereas, like I said, other people, they, they don't even want to think that way. You know, I know people that are so straight, they're afraid to do anything out, out of the realm of what's legal. But, you know, guys like you and I, you know, I don't know what it was. We, we were just predestined to do something else. You know, even today, Sean, I'll be honest with you, even today, you know, in business, things pop into my mind all the time. And, you know, I, I say this, honestly, I say this in church when I'm speaking. I said, look, you know, I stole a lot of money from the government, you know, in defrauding them out of tax on, on in the gasoline business I was in. And I said, right now, today, I don't have any moral issue with defrauding the government out of taxes. Morally, I don't, I don't have a problem with it because I think I'll do better with the money than they will. They're all thieves anyway, and they're robbing it. The difference is now I won't do it because I don't want to put my wife and, you know, children in trouble. I don't want to break the law. But my, my, my moral compass says it's, it's okay. But I won't do it because I don't want to get in trouble. You know, it's a different thing. I, I think maybe you feel the same way. We've both got that rebellious spirit in us. <laughs> yes. And I completely agree about the government. The political class is the biggest mafia. And, you know, less money for them to spend on bombing the poorest countries in the world. Right. That's the way I view it. But I don't want to go back. Sheriff Joe Ar Arpaio's jail no. scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I live a very safe, law-abiding life right now. Let me ask you, did you meet Joe Arpaio? Did he uh, personally visit you? You see all these video clips of Sheriff Joe on the YouTube, and he's got all these adoring inmates around him wearing the black and white pajamas saying, Sheriff Joe, you know, you got me off the drugs, and here I am, turning oh, yeah. my life around. The reality was, whenever Sheriff Joe entered the Maricopa County jail system, all of a sudden you would hear banging on the walls yeah. and the combination sink toilet banging on the metal. And this banging would just grow louder and louder and louder. And then you'd hear, fuck you, Arpaio. <laughs> you eat this motherfucking shit. Wow. You take this shit home to your family. You know, you treat your fucking family like this. And you'd see this little guy walk in with his goon squad circling him, like these massive guys, and all his abuse would just rain down and down and down upon him, and then he'd disappear. Wow. That's what the prisoners thought about that piece of shit. Yeah, that, that's what I, I assume, but we'll, we'll get to that. I want to get to the prison stuff. I want, to, I want to move along with the story. So you're making a lot of money in the stock market at a young age, and then all of a sudden it seems like the club scene and you know the, the nightlife and the high life like that kind of you know, got into your system or into your brain and, and, and things started to change. Tell us about it. Yeah, this is really a story of two people because... People look at me and just see the boy next door. But my best friend from childhood who died last year's funeral just before Christmas is up here. I don't know if you can see him. His name is Wild Man. Yeah. He was um, six foot two, 28 and a half stone when he died. Mm -hmm. I think one stone's like 14 pounds. So he was a big fella. And um, when we were kids, I was the studious one. I did do some risk taking stuff, but he was out committing violent crimes in his school, he, when he grew big, he picked the school teacher up and put him in the dumpster. And the teachers were so scared of him, they had him outside raking leaves with the caretaker. Mm. That was what it was like the last few years at school with him. Before he went to prison, in my hometown, there is a quarry in a place called Pex Hill. And if you get through the iron railings, there's a tree overlooking the quarry that me and Peter Wildman used to call the thinking tree. And that's where we set our goals. So me, wild man, and his cousin Hammy are on the thinking tree discussing what we're going to do with our lives. So wild man says, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison. I've got red dots in my head telling me to hurt people. And Hammy asked me what I'm going to do. I say, look, I'm going to go over to America make a million in the stock market and fly you guys over, which I eventually did. And to Wildman, I said, look, you're not going to spend the rest of your life in prison. 
I'm going to fly you to America and you're going to get a job as a wrestler. Because I've been watching stuff like Andre the Giant, things like that back then. I'm thinking, wild man can channel his aggressive energies into that, won't go off to prison. This is my idealistic teenage dream for us. So for five years in Arizona, I'm just working diligently in the stock market as a stockbroker. First two years, it's commission only. I'm leaving, living off cheese sandwiches and bananas, not making any money, wondering, you know, worried I'm going to have to come home because all I'm doing is living off my student credit cards. But five years in, I'm the top guy in the office grossing half a million a year. Yeah. Wild man flies over. He's done a prison sentence for a robbery with violence in England. Fly him to Arizona. And I get him a place to stay at, which is right by the Georgian Dragon British Pub, Central Phoenix. I'm thinking, while I'm at work, he'll just chill out, have a beer with the expats, and he won't cause any trouble. So within a couple of months of him staying at this place, I go over there with my girlfriend at the time. We knock on the door. A bunch of Mexicans answer the door. I say, where's Peter? Peter? There's no Peter here. I'm like, yeah, Peter lives here. They're like, pizza? No, no, Peter. They all pull guns out. Me and my girlfriend start backtracking across the road. A wild man just bounces over the road, all smiles. I'm like, what the fuck, Peter? You just really got a <laughs> shot. What is going on with your place? He goes, oh, don't worry about them. They're the local crack dealers. They like to move around a lot. I've rented that place out to them because they do like to move around a lot. They've got me living in their place over the street. They're giving me as much crack as I want for free because they're buzzing because I can do a $100 crack rock in one breath. Jeez. And the boss is the Colombian guy at the back there, and he wants to invest in the stock market. So th that house ended up with a corpse on the doorstep. Hmm. I'm working in the brokerage, get a call from my aunt. She goes, Peter's apartment is headline news. He might be dead. Someone's been shot dead. Get your ass up there. I go up there. It's all taped off. There's media. There's police cars. I've got drugs in the car. Shit myself. Go back to work. But to knowing in my head what's happened, is Peter alive? Go back later on in the day. Everybody's gone. Walk in. And... Peter is sat in the living room with a very grave-faced individual with a penetrating gaze who introduces himself as a homicide detective. They've took Peter off and they've done some print, you know, they've tested him for gunpowder and he, he wasn't the shooter in this situation. But they wanted to know some more information. So what had happened is, and I was glad, you know, seeing Peter alive, I was glad. So I found out what had happened is, a couple had come over to buy crack from the Mexicans, but the Mexicans had moved back over the street. The female goes over the street to get the crack. The male stays with wild man. The male has a gun on him. Wild man has never seen guns before. He says, look, I'm from England. We don't have guns. How does this work? Can you show it to me? So the guy is demonstrating his gun. And he says, the safety's on. Don't worry, it won't shoot. This is how we do it in America. Pulls the trigger and blows his own head off wow. in front of yeah. Peter. Sean, where, where was this? What town was this in? This is in Central Phoenix, uh, wow. in that neighborhood, right behind the Georgian Dragon British pub. Coolidge. The street was Coolidge. I remember exactly the street. Hmm. Yeah. So the homicide detective then is like, look, you know, what's the deal? Why is this guy living in here? Why is he over here? So I say, yeah, he's with me. I've signed for this place. Put it in, you know, it's, it's, it's in my name. He's over here from England, um, having a, quite a long holiday, blah, blah, blah. Whenever we got in trouble, we would try and play the English card. Yeah. This did work well in the beginning, but when things got heavy, um, it, 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 there was nothing was going to start what was going to happen to us then. Were you doing drugs at this point in time? Were you trying it yourself? Yeah, yeah. You when, when Peter came over, I lost my sensibility and just started to party like crazy with him. So I'm on ecstasy, I'm on crystal meth. And it was during his first visit, because he was deported three times for being a menace to society. 
Hmm. And I was sending teams of people through Canada and Mexico to bring him back in over and over again. Um, but it was the connections I made through Wild Man that enabled me to establish the criminal enterprise. So after the corpse on the doorstep, this has got to be about 96, 97. Peter knows a woman on the west side. She's living in this uh, apartment with a bouncer from a nightclub on Van Buren. This bouncer's got long blonde permed hair like a Chippendale. He's a big guy, big muscles, works out, steroid head. But I'm thinking, because Wildman is so aggressive, it's probably a bad combination of people. But I signed the lease anyway. I got up there and signed the lease. Within days, the apartment manager calls me at the stock brokerage, says, you need to come down here. We're evicting Peter. He's beat up his roommate. So, well, how do you know he's beat up his roommate? The roommate was seen running through the apartment complex in the night by the neighbors. He had plasterboard powder all over his face, and there's human head size holes in all of the walls. Fortunately, Wildman had done that so fast, they hadn't even had time to cash the check. So I stopped the check. Now, the woman in that apartment said, Look, I've got um, a place in Tempe, Arizona. It's, it's one of our boyfriends over there. He's behind on the rent. Can you fix the rent? Wild man can move in over there. He eventually becomes completely unhousable. But he goes to Rancho Marietta, Tempe, Arizona. Student town, huge complex, multiple buildings. And that's where we were partying our asses off on ecstasy. And I could only get 50 to 100 pills from the local dealers. Now, I'm just showing off. My ego back then was getting as big as the Grand Canyon as this enterprise grows. This was the start of it. And when you're giving drugs away for free, because I've got the most money, you attract a lot of friends, forever friends. I know. But then I start to see the business potential. I can only get 50 to 100 from the, the dealers. And people come in all night long saying, we want to buy 50, we want to buy 100. we got you know, this party, that party to, to take them to. So something started to twig. So my supplier back then was a guy called Acid Joey. Most of my male friends then, extremely high risk individuals, they're dead. Acid Joey was found dead in his swimming pools with all of his clothes on. And Acid Joey, stocky Native American guy, always wore black clothes, did a lot of ketamine, and he was the best dancer you could ever see. First <laughs> time I saw him, I show up at a rave. There's a circle of people around him. He was moving his body like it was water. This guy should have been in music videos. So Acid Joey finds out that the pills are coming from a surfer gangster guy in West Hollywood called Sol. So he arranges us for, to buy about a thousand pills. X is going for 25 to 30 in the clubs in Arizona. I think we arranged to buy them at around 12. Now, this is before I had proper protocol to avoid police detection. I'm a complete novice just starting out. Go out there, you know, and two car loads of people. Me, wild man, acid Joey, and another guy who was one of my protectors back then called Seth. He's also dead. He died about three years ago. His heart went out. Sean, let me let me ask you one question right now. Yeah. So it was really it was really Wild Man that got you involved in this whole party drug type of uh, environment. Is that correct? Okay. So if you look at me, you see this nerdy business guy who you wouldn't think could make relationships with dangerous people. In Wild Man's apartment in Tempe, Arizona, at Rancho Marietta. First thing he would do anywhere he went was would be he would take control of the street people and he'd have all of the street people working for him. Even when we went out to LA to pick pills up later on, street people that we'd only just met were dropping off crack rocks for him in the middle of the night. So he would go out and for some reason, the street people would always like just look up to him and do whatever he said. So he would take control of the street people, kick them down a little bits of this and that. And then he'd have these parties which were like, they range from like Native American, transgender sex workers to Russian mafia, Italian guys, um, gang bangers, striptease dancers. And they would just go for days on end. And it was such an eclectic mix of people that you wouldn't normally see together. But because they were all doing XC for the first time, they're in there just hugging and smiling and telling each other their life stories. And it was a really good atmosphere. And that's how 
because later on, I got the New Mexican Mafia protecting me. And it was through Peter that I met those guys. Fascinating story about how, you know, you are who you hang with. Something that I tell our young people, I've been telling them that for 25 years, you are who you hang with. People that you're around influence you. When I was in the mob, I was influenced, you know, and I was accountable to my oath. I was accountable to my boss. I was accountable to the guys around me. And therefore, I was involved in criminal activity all the time. Sean Atwood, okay, originally a legitimate guy, brilliant guy, by the way, very, very, very smart, very well spoken you know out of England um, made some brilliant success uh, had some brilliant success in the stock business he was a great trader knew what the heck he was doing he gets involved with a guy called wild man he actually knew him all his life you know he was they were friends but he gets really involved with him gets involved in the drug scene gets involved in the party scene his by his own admission a kind of a nerdy guy you know he was a guy that got beat up you know most of his young life he wasn't a tough guy he wasn't a gangster in any way but but again, the people he started to hang around with started to take drugs. The drugs got into his head. Look, I know what drugs can do. You know my story. Sister died of an overdose. A brother, 25 years, a drug addict. I know the whole scene, even though I never got involved with it myself. But it totally kind of changed his personality and character. And uh, what happened to him is fascinating. It really is. Right from his you know, young age, through his stockbroking, his stock trading age, to all the money that he made, gets involved in an ecstasy ring, uh, ends up up going down for it goes to prison and now has transformed his life what well, I should say brought his life back to where it should have been from day one but it's a fascinating story but again bottom line here people you are who you hang with who you are accountable to I say this all the time Sean's gonna give a good message at the end of this he did six years in prison you know I did eight visit my father for 30 some odd years we got a lot to talk about here you go Sean Atwood let me ask you a question then, because this is something that I always say and, um, you know, that I, I think my viewers are in tune with. You know, I always tell people, you are who you hang out with. And it seems to me that you met a guy that for some reason was attractive to you, his type of lifestyle, the way he carried himself. And, uh, and you started to, you know, just move in and jump in with him. So... You know, again, you are who you hang with. And then it's, it's Acid Joey, it's, it's Wild Man, it's, it's all of these people that start to come around you and you get into, because you're a, you're a fairly legit guy at that point, you know, before you meet him. You know, you're, you're a stockbroker, you're making a lot of money, and all of a sudden you're introduced to a different type of lifestyle through somebody and you become just like them. And that's why I tell people all the time, Sean, I know we'll get into this later, you know, you are who you hang with. When I was on the street and in the mob, that's who I was. I was around criminals. I became a criminal. I'm not blaming them. This was my decision and so on. And I know you feel the same way. You made that decision. But um, that's why it's so important in life to know who you're hanging with and who you're accountable to. And, uh, you know, we get to that a little bit. But I just wanted to make that point. Keep going. Yeah, absolutely. So me and Wildman were bonded from childhood. As kids, as teenagers, we'd watched a lot of movies like The Wanderers and The Warriors. And some local boys in my neighborhood formed a little gang called The Sweats. Mm -hmm. Now, the leader of the gang was Wildman's oldest brother. And Wildman was two years younger than me, younger, younger than any of the gang members. When I say gang members, I'm not talking about armed and knives yeah. and all that shit. Just in, it's quite innocent back then. So his oldest brother would beat the shit out of him and would not let him join the gang. But eventually, I gravitated towards Wildman. The mm. sweats beat the shit out of me for hanging out with him. They dangled mm. me off the Pexhill Quarry cliff face. And I was done with them then. So me and Hammy splintered off from the sweats. And that's how me and Wildman and Hammy became best friends for life. And we were up the thinking tree making those goals. So that's a little backstory of how that came about. So now you're in Phoenix. You're starting yeah. to really understand what you can make in this drug ecstasy business. And you start to move forward again using your entrepreneurial mind that you have. You're starting to figure out a way how to monetize and capitalize on this. So keep going. Okay, so before the New Mexican Mafia stuff, then, I'll go over to Sol. I'll continue that story. Two carloads of us, they're all dead now except for me, go to Sol's house, West Hollywood. He's not other, there at the prearranged time. Wild man is losing patience. He's like, as soon as this guy shows up, I'm going to kick his door in. I'm going to take his shit. You don't just leave us out here waiting for hours like this. It's disrespectful. I'm like, Peter, 
calm the fuck down. If we go out there and take his shit, how are we going to have a regular connect? We've got to establish a business relationship with this guy. If this is going to be, you know, a worthwhile experiment in getting into the XC trade. So I calmed him down. Eventually, Saul shows up. Have you seen that movie, Point Break? Yes, I have. He shows up with a bunch of guys straight out of Point Break. I've never seen anything like it before, coming from the UK. Go in the house on my own. I say to Peter beforehand, you guys wait out here. If I'm out in 20 minutes, just fucking storm in. Come and rescue me. I go in. Saul has got some pills, and I ask, can I taste one? Because I've been doing XC since I was at university. I knew exactly what a pill tastes like. It should be 100, 125 milligrams of MDMA and clay. It's got a very distinct taste. So he gives me one. He says, do you want to drink with it? I said, no. I need to chew it to taste it properly. Chewed it. It was good. I handed over the bills. He handed over the pills. I'm a bit apprehensive because... I'm thinking, you know, is he going to rob me at any moment? A cop's watching his place. But once I got out there, got in the car, I felt a bit more confident. I mentioned earlier I was naive to police protocol at this point. I like to go and get schooled by the New Mexico Mafia guys in that. But so <laughs> I've got a twin turbo Mazda RX-7, like a fucking spaceship, this dark blue color that changes in the light. I've got a radar detector on the dashboard. I've got DJ Sasha playing through the Bose surround sound system. And I've got fur on the leather seats. All the way back, I'm going like almost 150 miles an hour with the radar detector every now and go, <laughs> slam on, <laughs> slow down. Think, fucking hell, if we get pulled over anyway, we'll just play the English card. 40 minutes in, the ecstasy starts to hit me. Have you ever done ecstasy? Never have, Sean. I, I got to tell you this right now. I've never done any kind of drug in my life except for one time, and I'll let, I'll let you know what it was. I was a younger guy, and I was with a girl. It was before I was married, well, well before. And um, she says to me, I'm going to give you a quaalude, and we're going to have a really good time tonight. And then she looked at me, and she said, you know what? You're so straight in that regard. I'm going to cut it in half. I'm going to give you half a quaalude. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took it and we partied that night. That's the only drug I've ever taken in my entire life. That's it. Well, that's probably because you're so strong minded. Well, I don't, maybe because I, I don't know if I'm that strong minded and I don't want to get hooked. You know, it's, it's e either or, yeah. but it's easy to get hooked. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why most of my friends back from back then are dead. So no. we're driving back, managed to get back to Rancho Marietta, the complex. And those pills are gone in a weekend. So I make that fateful decision. Do I want to maintain stockbroker status in the office six o'clock in the morning sales meeting, calling people all day? Or can I just make money from the party scene? Hell yeah, I'm just going to make money from the party scene. So my <laughs> emotional immaturity took over. And... When you're involved in anything like that, as it gets bigger, you need people protecting you. At the peak of it, you know, I've got about 200 people working for me. I've got my own security team. But in the beginning, the guys who had my back. So in Rancho Marietta, by now, we have established multiple apartments in that complex that are either moving ecstasy for us or we could call on them for help if there's a situation. We're chilling out one day. And we're having like an apartment party, listening to music. And a ruggedly handsome Chicano guy shows up, long, dark hair, prison tattoos, chains. And because he's bringing the meth, the weed, the coke, and I'm bringing the ecstasy, we are having a conversation. At some point, a cop walks in. He says, I could smell weed from outside, nobody move. G-Dog, the Mexican-American guy, just pulls out his gun, points at the cop, says, the only one who's not leaving is you, motherfucker. Everyone, run. So we all just run off into the night. I've never seen anything this heavy before. I'm absolutely shitting myself. I'm thinking, we're all going to prison for the rest of our lives. This maniac just pulled a cop, uh, pulled a gun on a cop. So I'm in an apartment that's owned by a guy called Fish. 
who's selling XC for us. Fish is freaking out. He's like, look, we've got to flush all our shit. The cops are going to be everywhere. So we're all in panic mode. Wildman wasn't with us at that point. What happens next is there's like bang, 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 bang on the French windows. It's g Dog. What are we going to do? Better let him in. He comes in. And he schooled us right away. He said, look, turn the lights off. Turn the TV off. They haven't had time to get a warrant. If they knock on the door, don't fucking answer it. Everyone keep quiet. And that's what we did. And the cops came. They went door to door. And it just passed. The danger passed. There was mm. one cop car at the front of the complex later on. We had multiple vehicles in there. And I said to G-Dog, look, I've got a place in Central Phoenix, a house over there. You're so hot in this area right now. Why don't I take you over there to cool off? And that's what I did. I took him over there. So after that night, he said, look, because you and your friends protected me, me and my brothers have got your back. And he had mm -hmm. no idea what that meant. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, he says, one of my brothers wants to meet you. So Tempe, Arizona, street with low rider showcase cars all the way down it. We knock on the door. And his brother answers, short guy, bald. And he's looking up at me like, you know, who the F is this guy? And I start speaking and he hears my English accent. And he, like, he, he says, damn, you talk funny. You really <laughs> must be from England. Come in and meet my homies. Hmm. So we walk inside and there's all the biggest Mexican-Americans now in the room that I've ever seen in my life. Massive guys with little wife beater vests, shorts down below the knees, prison tats, chains. And they're all looking at me like they want to eat me. You know, I'm the skinny English guy, business graduate. They're like, what the fuck is this guy doing here? So I'm looking around the room. There's, there's guns, there's slabs of drugs, weighing apparatus. And I did a double take on the TV. Oh yeah, next to the TV, they've got a screen showing all the comings and goings on the street in case the cops try and raid the house. But I do a double take on the TV. That's not an ornament on top of the TV. I've seen one of them before. Oh yeah, it was in a Rambo movie. They had a rocket propelled grenade launcher on top of the TV. I remember that. So <laughs> one of them swings a spoonful of coke in my face. It's like, snort that. And G-Dog's like, yeah, snort that. And I snorted it. The brother took me into a separate room and asked me some questions. And they started to get ecstasy from me and I started to get some drugs from them. And the guy who swung that spoon in my face, I later learned when they all got sent down because their faces were on the mugshots for headline news. He was a hitman, alleged hitman, let's say on a killing spree. And um, people knew those guys had my back. So it kept me out of situations, let's say. And because they're an active mafia, there's only so much I can say on certain stories, but here's one of the stories. And this is where both of my worlds collide. I'm at the, that junction now where I'm still a stockbroker and I'm about to go over to become an ecstasy trafficker. I get a call at the office from Fish. Fish says, can you get well, man? I've got a situation. I need you to come over. I say, what's up? He says, I can't say over the phone. You just need to come and see. Get well, man. I go to try and get Wildman. Wildman is out in, in Central Phoenix collecting debts for the Colombian crack trafficker. So I couldn't get Wildman. So I go over to Tempe to Fishy's place, knock on the door. His girlfriend answers and she's crying. So I think she's been assaulted and Fish wants us, you know, wants Wildman to do something about this, beat the guy up, whatever. So I say, what's up? And they're kind of like stunned. It's like they can't talk. And all of a sudden, from a room, I hear like, I'm like, what the fuck was that? So I walk in. They say, go and look. You need to go and look at what that was. Go into the room. Now, there's one of G-Dog's friends in there that I've previously met from these apartment parties. He's an older Mexican or Mexican-American guy with stately silver swept back hair. He's calmly instructing a group of Mexicans 
as if like this is just another day at the office. Instructions in Spanish. And when he's giving these instructions in Spanish, they've got cattle prods and there's a naked hogtied man on the floor. He's got a rockabilly quiff. And when he's giving these instructions, they're electrocuting him with the cattle prod. And this guy starts going like a rocking horse. He's gagged, so he can't make noise. His eyes, you can see if he's fearing for his life. And when they electrocute him, piss just shoots out of his penis. So I've not seen anything like this before in my life. And I'm looking at the guy running this operation thinking, if I show fear, they're going to think I'm a liability and want to take me out to the desert. How do I handle this situation? So I just kind of put on a brave face, smiled at the guy, and said, look, I can't get wild, man. Looks like you guys have got the situation under control. I've come over here from work. I've got to get back to my office. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll um, update Wildman on the situation. If you need his help, you guys just let us know. And that's how I extricated myself from that. But I'll drive him back to the office. I was having nightmares about the fate of that guy. I did find out what happened. Well, I found out first why they had him. And that was, Fish told me that he'd sold drugs for that guy. He was a customer. When Fish left the apartment, the guy went back. And, and how, this is how Fish said it to me. The guy broke in, he robbed your drugs, he robbed her drugs. I called you, I called them, and they got here first. And what they did was they told his roommates they had 24 hours to go with 10 Gs, otherwise he was gone. And they came up with the money and they released him. So that was the end of that. That was your first real experience with uh, Mexican guys, obviously. They don't play games, you know, in the drug business for sure. But that was kind of eye-opening for you. And you realized at that point what you, were, what you were dealing with, I guess. But because I was so emotionally mature, I'm telling myself, I'm living like a character in Pulp Fiction. Mm -hmm. This is like a movie. And the drugs, the more of the drugs that I did, they scramble your decision-making processes and they're telling you, you know, this is cool. So let me ask you this. At this point, you see something like that. Do you say to yourself, you know, this is not for me. I'm in over my head and maybe now it's time to make my exit before I have to deal with these guys. If something goes wrong, I could be in trouble. Or do you say, you know what? All right. You know, I'm, I'm still into it. I'm ready to go. And now I want to do it in a big way. Well, obviously, I know what you did, but what, what's your thought process at that point? Okay, so I'm in shock for a couple of days thinking I shouldn't be doing this. This is wrong. That guy could have got killed. This is way too heavy. And then once that shock had wore off and the weekend came around and I'm partying with wild man for two days on end without any sleep with striptease dancers, having the time of my life, I've gone right back to it. Amazing. Amazing. So even though that made such an, I mean, look, that's something that, you know, a normal, legit kind of guy with your background would say, I'm done, I'm out. But, you know, again, there's that something in some of us that, you know, uh, that just keeps us going in that same direction, you know, and I th I, I, would, I probably would have reacted. To, I definitely would have reacted the same way. All right, I'm into this now. Let's go. When I was in my high school, I was one of the last to grow in my year group. So the rugby players bullied the shit out of me. I was scared to go out to break and I would hide in the technical drawing room. And then when I was 16 and I passed my driver's license test and I went to fill up my mom's little red car with petrol, I mean, gas, as you guys call it, mm -hmm. um, four big rugby player sized guys in the 20s came up to me. I thought it was brave to stand up to them. They got me on the floor, kicking me in the head, kicking me in the face. One had an iron bar, smashed me in the face, knocking the bottoms of my teeth out. So I've got these veneers on my front teeth. So I was a very anxious teenager. For a, for a period of years, wouldn't go out and dance, wouldn't go out and talk to women. But once I started to get on ecstasy, I was in the complete reverse. I was this massive party animal. So to go from like a nobody in a chemical manufacturing town who was getting bullied to being Mr. Cool Guy, the guy with the pills, and have all these beautiful American women coming up to me because of my English accent, because I was throwing these parties, that's just, you know, it just became this thing that, that fed my ego. 
It was a high. It was, uh, I get it. I understand it. I, I hear where you came from and what, you know, the way people were accepting you, looking at you now, looking up to you, wanting you to be, you know, uh, wanting to be in your presence. I mean, I get it. You know, it's, it's powerful when things like that take over. Let me ask you this, and I'm going to get in a little bit of a story in a minute. So now you yeah. dive into this and you have a, you know, a, a brilliant mind and you're figuring out, uh, OK, how do I capitalize? How do I get the best possible product on the street? How do I make people have to come to me for the best? And so you start to think about it and you find a way. Yeah. So I lose Wildman for the first time at this point. He has gone through so many apartments and <laughs> so many hotels that have banned him. First off, he meets a woman who was a striptease dancer who was into s and She showed up at one of these apartment parties. Wildman's party tricks were to just sit there and say to the whole room, who wants to punch me in the face as hard as they want or taser me? Here, I've got a taser. And people <laughs> would punch him and taser him and he would just giggle like his toes had been tickled. So this woman who's shown up with her bat steroid head bouncer boyfriend walks up to wild man and goes, that's nothing. I taser my pussy. So wild man's like, well, show me. And she's just like, says, well, I can't cause I'm with him. And wild man says, well, send him off to do something. <laughs> this is a crazy story. <laughs> he says, I've got spaghetti bolognese in the kitchen. <laughs> Tell him to go and heat up some spaghetti bolognese for you. <laughs> and that's, that's what this guy ends up doing. She hikes her skirt up. She's got no knickers on, gets the taser, and I'm watching this, and the, the blue lights are going up and down wow. her female parts. That was love at first sight. So what, yeah, when the guy came back with the spaghetti bolognese, he just, well, and just starts eating. He says, that's good. She's with me now. We're going to come over to yours later on and get all her stuff. And all, there was a standoff for a little bit, but the guy could see the craziness. In yeah, and he, he backed down. Left, slams the door and leaves. So it's love at first sight. So Wildman ends up on that first trip to America. Him and his girlfriend are like Bonnie and Clyde. Mm -hmm. They're just going around, ripping off clothes stores, going in restaurants and not paying. No work will happen. They're unhousable because they're so crazy. And they end up living under a tree in Tempe wow. Beach Park with a Rambo knife and a baseball bat. But Wildman has taken control of the street people at Tempe Beach Park. There was two Native American gangsters were coming around and shaking down the street people. And when they came around one night, Wildman just got out his bat, took care of that, and then he became string of the king of the street people there. But he ends up getting arrested judge decides that he's a menace to society and he's gone then for a good like two or three years but through my relationships with acid joey the supply came about and through g-dog i had protection and things just started to grow from there so as any businessman knows vertical and horizontal integration if you bring in the pills in and you're throwing the parties, you're fully integrated. If you've got your own bouncers, security, any outside dealers get shut down and those pills are recycled to the house and you've got a monopoly on the supply at these raves. And over time it built up whereby I structured it like a corporation. So I've got you know multiple heads of the divisions Every now and then we'd have a crime family dinner for the heads of the divisions and they've got the guys below them who are peddling the pills. And I also knew that if I only dealt with a select few people, that was my shield against law enforcement and any potential dangerous competitors because I would structure it in a way whereby they would have to penetrate that shield either arrest or take one of them out before they could get to me. So that's what enabled me to take it to the next level. 
Let me uh, give you some personal involvement I had with this. At the time, late late 90s, I was involved with a club on uh, Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. It was called Billboard Live at the time, and it was uh, had a partner there, and then uh, became the key club after that, after we finished with Billboard Live. So it went on for many, many years. There was a time there when ecstasy was filling that club. I mean, filling it. Everybody was partying on ecstasy. And it got to my attention, my partner's attention, and I'm talking to some of the bouncers, I said, where's this stuff coming from, you know? And one of them even offered this. I said, Mike, you know, I had somebody come in, you know, we can run a little racket in here, we can make extra money. I said, no, we don't do that. You know, I'm on parole, I don't want any part of that, you know, and plus I'm not in the drug business at all. So uh, I'm doing some research, and I'm finding out where's this stuff coming from? And people are telling me it, it's just from English guy um, out of Arizona someplace that's supposedly the big supplier, right? English guy, didn't tell me your name. And then, and then I hear, you know, that Sammy Gravano is also involved in this and that that's where the stuff is coming from. And there's some dealers in L.A. that are bringing it in there. And uh, shortly after that, I was going to reach out to Sammy. You know, I knew all the situation with him, and I'm saying, this guy, with all the stuff he's got going on, he's not dealing in drugs out here? Well, he gets popped, you know, shortly after that, and that was the end of that. I didn't hear what happened with you, and then later on, I got, you know, I kept the ecstasy out of the club. I said, if we find it in here, we're throwing you out. I told the bouncers we can. I said, with my association with this club, I'll be the biggest ecstasy dealer in town and never have touched a stop, but they'll put it all on me, so I want everybody out of here. But um, that was kind of, <laughs> the, but this English guy, out of Arizona is the main supplier, him and Sammy Gravano. And I'm wondering, did they connect? Did they hook up? You know, did Sammy get some guy from England? What's really going on? So well, I'm glad you said that because that confirms my story. And coming from someone like you, a lot of people are going to hear that and think, wow. So I appreciate that, Michael. Well, that's the truth. That, that's the way it went down. What actually happened with you and Sammy? Okay, before we get to the Sammy stuff, let me just say how the transportation methods changed. So I'm getting 1,000 to 5,000 pills out of LA, figure out they're getting them from Holland. Mm -hmm. I'm paying what, eight to 10 out of LA by now. Holland, $2 a pill. One of my smugglers gets stopped at Sky Harbor Airport. A woman, wild woman actually, wild man's girlfriend from Liverpool, who on his first visit, he had just told her he was going to the corner shop to buy a bottle of milk and he jumped on a plane to Arizona. And she was so, she was called wild woman for a reason. They mm -hmm. were just, yeah, yeah. They were both pretty dangerous people. So wild woman gets stopped at Sky Harbor airport. The pills are in a luggage in vitamin containers. The customs people take her into a back room, open the luggage, put them on the table and they say, what are they? She says, vitamins. They say, cool, pick them up, put them back in a luggage, and tell us have a nice day. <laughs> wow. Now, now, that was a close call. I was going to say, that was pre-9-11 for sure. Yeah, they yes. hadn't quite caught up with ecstasy either properly. Right. It, was a, it, was, it was still comparatively new. The feds hadn't come in to Arizona when Gravano's people lit, lit the scene up. That's what happened, and that's that, that caused the demise. Mm. So what happens next is, Everybody who works for me has legal benefits. If they get arrested, we post a bail bond. We tell them, plead the fifth. We'll get you out. We'll assign you a lawyer. If you've not got any criminal history, you probably won't even do any prison time. First time offense. That worked out really well. Now, we had a female lawyer we relied on. So when our woman got busted at Sky, not busted, stopped at Sky Harbor, I asked the female lawyer, what should we do about our trafficking route? And she said, anyone coming from Holland to America, it's a red flag. You got to start running this through Mexico. If you're, a, if you're a gringo crossing the Arizona border and you've got scuba diving tanks, pinatas, tourist bric-a-brac, this is what we did. We had SUVs with University of Arizona stickers. No one's going to stop you. Stop. So yeah. our route was, Hermosillo Airport to Mexico City, Air France, Paris flight, and then you get a train over to Holland. Before 9-11, you could put pills in pillowcases and get on a flight. I remember. If you wanted to be more secure, you could put them in computer towers screwed in. 
So wow. the most we ever got through in one shipment was 40,000 pills using that method. And that's how it got big. Now, it was all going well until a new kind of XC dealer started to show up in the clubs. These are steroid head jock characters, not like the ravers that we, we were dealing with. And they were aggressive and they were loud and they were bragging that they were the biggest XC barons in the history of the world. And they were bringing a lot of heat in with them. So I had a wife um, at that point. She was a very intelligent woman. She was doing lesbian internet porn when I met her. She was extremely wild, doing a lot of drugs. She joined a strip club because she fancied a strip tease woman in there. And she joined the strip club just to seduce that woman and have a relationship with her, which did succeed. She had another lesbian, a bisexual lover, who was dating one of these new type of ecstasy dealers, the steroid heads. And through that, the relationships through the women, the word came through my wife that these guys wanted to meet me. So we go to a bar in Tucson called Heart Five. Because I'm curious, who are these guys stepping on my toes? And I take one of my bodyguards with me, one of the Rossetti brothers. He's strapped. And I say, look, if these guys pull any moves, try and kidnap me, just open up on the motherfuckers, get me the hell out of there. Now, I've got this anxiety, you know, but I'm on drugs for over 10 years. This is how I was able to front being a bit crazy to get away with these deals. So before I went in there, I'm thinking, all right, they've heard of English Sean. They've probably got a, a misconception, you know, that I'm some big tattooed gangster looking guy. Right. So I'm going to have to act a bit crazy because I'm not wild man and wild man's not here. So I drank some GHB. I did some crystal meth. Wow. Go in there. And a guy called the Spaniard says, pleased to meet you, English Sean. Come through to the VIP room and meet my partner. So we go into the VIP room. This is this six and a half foot guy. His biceps are bigger than my head. <laughs> and he yells at everybody in the VIP room to get the fuck out. And they jump up off the sofa, the chairs, the room is cleared. They obviously know who these people are. Now, when I was a kid and I used to stay at my grandfather Fred's house, a trick he used to prey on me was when he would walk past me, he would grab my leg just above the knee, really tight, like, and make me jump. And I'm thinking, what, what crazy thing can I do? And it just came to me. I'll sit down in between them on the sofa, grab both their legs above the knee and make them jump. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I did. So they're looking at me like, this guy's something not, 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 something not right about this guy. He's fucking, this guy's nuts. So the Spaniard was very calm. He's like, look, Sean, we know you're tight with the locals. We know you're moving a lot of product. We're moving our product. Why don't you move some of our product? Now, I've been at this for years already in Arizona, and my product is a white or beige pill, 100, 125 milligrams of MDMA. My traffickers took... Um, test kits from a website called Dance Safe, which changes the, you know, the pill goes purple blue to show you the composition of the pill. I was cognizant that if I'm bringing tens of thousands of pill in per shipment, someone could potentially die. It's extremely rare. Most of the times when people die from ecstasy, it is because of the toxic ingredients put in the pills. Nobody ever died from our pills. We would have known right away. We tested them. We had this good reputation. So I said to them, you guys are moving these colored pills. I've got a reputation for my white beige press. I'm not going to get involved with your colored pills. Now, the big guy jumps off the sofa at this point. Who the fuck do you think you are disrespecting our pills? Don't you know who we work for? One call to Sammy the Bull, and we can have you taken out to the desert. So I was aware from the news, Sammy the Bull, Gambinos, murdered almost two dozen people. I'm thinking, is this guy just blowing smoke or is this real? I go out back into the bar, into the main room. My wife is unconscious. She's drank so much GHB. Rosetti, 
my bodyguard who'd come in behind me, he'd been watching everything, picks my wife up and we go out to the car. Rosetti's like, what's up? I said, they said they are working for Sammy the Bull Gravano. He's like, oh shit, this is heavy. I said, well, don't sweat it. I said to them, it's not each other we need to worry about, it's the feds. Since you guys came into the scene, there are cars with tinted windows driving around. We're watching windows go down on these cars with cameras, videoing fucking license plates and people going into the clubs. You've got to stop going around. You know, your, your, your dealers are going around saying, bragging they're the biggest XC barons in the history of the world. You've got to be more on the down low if, if this is, you know, there's enough demand for XC for us to coexist. That was the last thing I said to him. You know, Sean, I got to tell you, this reminded me of a scene in an American gangster, you know, when Denzel Washington is in the club talking to Nicky Barnes, if you remember, and Denzel says, I have a brand, his drugs were called Blue Magic, right? You know, Nicky Barnes was kind of trading on that name, giving a lesser quality product and, uh, and they kind of had a blow up. So it's kind of, this is real life imitating art, so to speak, or art imitating real life, you know, the well, other way around. Know, business reputation is everything. Exactly. So if, I adul if I adulterate my reputation with these colored pills. Exactly, exactly. The piece didn't last long. So you, you never met, did, did you ever meet Sammy? Never ever met Sammy, I mean, never have I claimed to have met Sammy. Sammy put something out recently saying, He's never, ever met me. And, you know, my followers who have read my books, um, Party Time is up there, which details everything. And if you look at my videos on Sammy, they all say Sammy the Bulls crew. None of them say I ever met Sammy. So in that regard, you're both consistent. Sammy says he never met you, and you know you never met Sammy. So there's no, there's no issue there. There's no issues there, but as my channel has got big, and as I've done a lot of content exposing elite pedophilia and the epstein case mm. i am getting trolled the fuck out of right now that people are trying really? to shut my channel down left and right they have the trolls have contacted everybody from my life my prosecutor my ex-girlfriend sammy the bull and they've tried to create um disputes between everybody from my past life they're trying to find holes in my story and they've, they're just trying to cause uh, general chaos to get me shut down but going back it's to my story bad. then the piece did not last very long. Another clique who we found out were saying they were working for Sammy the Bull, because Sammy's now saying that he wasn't even running the ecstasy. Let's just say they said they were working for Sammy the Bull to play it safe. Don't want to piss Sammy off. I love his channel. I've subscribed and I sit there riveted to his stories and your stories. Both you guys are the to-go guys for Matthew stories for a lot of people here in the UK and congratulations to both of you on your success. Thank you. So, and Sam, just, uh, just if, if I can add to that, Sammy and I have different styles. Sammy's a great storyteller and Sammy, you know, Sammy, because of his situation, um, you know, he can expand a little bit more on, on things that I, I just, you know, I, I don't have that luxury, but uh, it's great. And, and I agree. Look, he's the real deal. No doubt about it. He tells the story great. And, and, and the channel is growing and I'm happy for him. You know, this is this is what he's chosen to do. And and I appreciate your saying that, you know, the both of us uh, are telling it like it is and, and giving people what they want to hear. Yeah. And when we get to the jail stuff. When Gerard Gravano was in Towers Jail, I think it's 2002, 2003, the guards know that we're rival cliques. So when we're going to court one night, when Gerard has just appeared after his, I think he got out on bail bond and he got rearrested, the guards handcuff Gerard to Wildman just to oh, see boy. what will happen. <laughs> Wow. I've come to know Gerard uh, lately. He, he's just really a, a nice guy. I really like him. I really do. Again, you've never met him, and I don't know what experience you've, you've had or heard about him, but he, he, he's a good guy. He really yeah, is. I met Gerard, and I kept in contact with him after his incarceration. I haven't spoke to him in recent years. Tell you what, he was a hell of an arm wrestler in Towers Jail. He was taking those big guys down really strong, and he told me a lot about his growing up and what he went through. And, you know, when you've got a dad like that, who is got such a high reputation for dangerous crimes, as glamorous as it is to the public, to some of the public, 
the kids can go through hell because of the pressures and the dangers and various other factors. So my heart goes out to him, what he went through, and he's a strong individual. He's running his business over there in Arizona. Looks like he's got a good woman from looking online. And uh, yes, and so power to him and what he's doing. And Sean, if I can expand upon that, you know, my dad being who he was and, you know, the reputation that he had, uh, it was very destructive to my family. I mean, you know, I had a sister that turned to drugs and, and eventually overdosed. She died at the age of 27. My younger brother uh, was a drug addict for 25 years. Um, and he eventually cooperated with law enforcement, testified against my dad, went into the witness protection program. My younger sister, because of my dad all the time he did, uh, you know, she died young of cancer, but she was, she was kind of a basket case, I have to say that, you know? And then of course my mom, you know, there was, it was tragic, the relationship with my dad. So, you know, and for some reason I was able to come out of all of that. It wasn't easy, but, but I did. And that's why I consider myself to be very blessed. But, uh, you know, I understand what Gerard went through and what his family had to go through as a result of Sammy's involvement in that life. One of the reasons, the main reasons why I stepped away was because I didn't want my family to, to get destroyed. And I knew it would because I had too much of a reputation. I was too much a target of law enforcement. Eventually, I was going to go down and go down big. There was no doubt about it. I just wanted my family to, you know, to avoid all of that and have a life. And, and that's the reason I stepped away. So when you say that about Gerard, uh, it's totally true. And I'm glad you made that observation because it's very accurate. You must have a unique skill set, Michael, to navigate that dangerous world, to come through it, with such a sound mind now and to be doing, you know, these things online and influencing so many people for the good to harness the negative and transform the energy to change people's lives. So it's absolutely brilliant what you're doing. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I, I attribute a lot of that again, accountability to having a good wife you know to having uh, made myself accountable to the right people that keep me straight because you know sean look and i know you're doing the right thing now and you're on the right track but there's always i always say you can take the boy out of brooklyn but you can't fully take brooklyn out of the boy we still have that tendency at times to say ah you know i'm, I'm ready to do something crazy but <laughs> but you know and I, I have it i'll be honest you know people say do you miss the old life and i said yeah at times i do i mean we had a good time you know of course there was a lot of both sides but you know the times we had were good and uh you know, you, you just got to put yourself in the right position, surround yourself with the right people and and uh, and just be strong enough to, you know, to stay on track. So let me also get back to this. At the end of the day, how did you get caught? Because, you know, I tell people all the time, I don't care who you are, how strong you are, how many good people you have around you. And I had all of that. But eventually you stay in that. You're going to go down. And it happened to you. How'd that happen? All right. So Sammy the Bulls crew a different faction from the guys i met in tucson they law skinner my top ecstasy sales guy to a nightclub in scottsdale and knock his teeth out mm. i get so concerned at this point that i move from scottsdale i was at to a million dollar house on the side of a mountain in the catalina foothills sinvacus community tucson where joe bonanno senior is one of my neighbors and miles down the mountain range is Paul McCartney. This mm. is a secured neighborhood whereby to get up onto the street, there's a guard at a barrier, and this guy has to call your house and raise the barrier to let anyone in. Mm -hmm. So I did that as a security precaution because I mentioned earlier, I had a protective shield, and I knew as soon as anyone in that protective shield got took down, I was next. Mm -hmm. So skin is down. I'm next. Moved to um in the, in the foothills there in Tucson. Most beautiful place I've ever lived in my life. Won't get into too much detail there, though. So I'm feeling quite confident now. I've got a right-hand guy called Cody Bates. I'm saying his name because he's dead. God bless him. After we all got busted, I, he was my right-hand guy because he never got high. After we all got busted, he got depressed. He said we were like his family. He went straight to heroin. His parents sent him to a rehab run by Scientologists. They put him on drugs. 
that had a side effect of committing suicide and he hung himself. Hmm. So Cody Bates, he rented an apartment just for the cash. He would drive all the way to my house in Tucson to discuss business. If everything was going smoothly with all the heads of the factions, he's collecting the cash, handing out the pills. There was no problems. I would just hang out there, you know, getting my party on with my wife and friends. Uh, if there was an issue, if someone wasn't paying or someone was giving us a problem or someone was trying to rob one of our guys, G Dog or Wild Man or, you know, one of the security guys would take care of that situation. Now, Skinner's had his teeth knocked out. I'm secure, wondering what's going on with the Gravano guys. And I think it was early after the millennium headline news, those guys got took down. And I was thankful that the cops had took out the competition. It was a multi-agency investigation. I didn't realize all those resources were going to be targeted at me. We had one guy who sold pills for us who was playing both sides and he was indicted with the 57 with, with Gravano. And that guy, he took $10,000 from, from one of our customers, went to buy pills from one of the Gravano guys, got pulled over leaving the house. Police took the pills, but let him go. Our customer went and complained to Wildman. Wildman finds the guy and says, look, what are you going to do about this? Well, cops took the pills. I haven't got the money, nothing I could do. Wildman hit him so hard, this guy's tooth ended up stuck between two of his knuckles and wouldn't come out. Wildman hated hospitals. He had to go to hospital. They took it out, but they told him it had to be sewed up. He's like, fuck that. I'll do it myself. He left the hospital, went home with, and with fishing wire, just, just sewed his fist up. But it got infected and he had to go to the, back to the hospital anyway. Hmm. So all those indictments go down for the first time. And I'm thank, you know, thanking the police for taking out the Gravano. But then the, the New Mexican Mafia heads go down as well. So g Dog over the years, has been in and out of prison. One night, we've been up to something, and I drop him off at his brother's house. We get to the neighborhood. The entire neighborhood is blacked out. There are guys out with light ones, like you see on the airline airport runways, guiding traffic. As we pull up to his brother's house, this is the house with the you know rocket propelled grenade launcher on top of the TV. Federal SWAT team are bringing all of these guys out. And we just look at them and just drive on. And then it was headline news that, that night. This is the first time I find out who they are. These are the heads of the New Mexican Mafia in Arizona. The, they are the most dangerous criminal organization in Arizona at that time. They are taking out witnesses, trying to assassinate cops, a judge, and they even tried to assassinate the head of the Arizona Department of Corrections back then. And people can yeah. find all this online, big news stories back then. And I'm looking at the mugshots and like, holy shit, you know, I've been... I've been meeting up with these guys for ages. It was always very tense whenever I went over there, and I always wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. They told me from the get-go, if you get pulled over leaving here, we've got a lawyer. You tell the cop you're in a hurry. You don't want the car searched. If they force a search upon you, you call this lawyer. You exercise your right to remain silent. So they completely schooled me in legal strategy and it was the lawyer I used later on who becomes a united front for all of the co-defendants. And that's why only four, we were so tight, only four of our over 100 co-defendants rolled versus with Sammy's crew, all 57 rolled. So Sammy's crew go down. Some of them get released on bail bond. So they're up to tricks and... I learned from the witness statements later on, there's 10 witness statements that authorized the wiretap, that it was some of the guys who were working for the Gravano enterprise were also telling the cops that they were working for me, whether they were or not, just trying to give the cops loads of information about me to get their situations reduced. And while I had a situation with one of them, a car ended up, I don't know, blown up or on fire, one of their cars, 
And that was that's in the police reports as well. So I'm thinking, oh, shit, you know, those guys have gone down. The New Mexican Mafia guys have gone down. Maybe I am next. Now, the female lawyer who gave us advice about bringing the pills through Mexico, she says, look, I've got a contact at the DEA. The heat is on. You should not be fucking going anywhere near drugs right now. I'd met a woman as well. I told her this. I was in love with this woman. She's like, Sean, this is so dangerous what you're doing. I'm scared of wild man. I'm scared of G-Dog. These people terrify me. Wild man just gets high and walks around for days on end and just ends up in a, in a random house of someone he doesn't even know and ends up with the cops getting called on him. These guys are maniacs. This is crazy. If you love me, you would quit this. So I actually quit a year before the SWAT team came. Yeah. I was living with my girlfriend in an apartment in Scottsdale. I'd enrolled in Scottsdale Community College. I was doing Spanish classes. Wow. I was doing kickboxing classes in Tempe. Back to trading the stock market online, day trading. And we were like, all right, things are so hot for us here still, even though I've quit, we need to move to LA. So we were about to move to LA. May 16th, 2002, I wake up early, get on the computer, um, selling shorts and shares um, through put options. And there's a knock on the door. Bam, 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 bam. Jump up, look through the people, blacked out. Is it the cops or is it people pretending to be the cops? Come to rob me. Peep out the window. The whole apartment is completely surrounded. I'm like, oh, fuck. What are we going to do? I go through to the bedroom to my girlfriend. All right, we better let him in because right now it's like more banging. Tempe Police Department, we've got a warrant. Open the door. We get halfway through the living room, then just boom. Mm. The door flies off the hinges, bangs into a wall, and then just falls on the floor. You must have been SWAT team raided, Michael. Oh, many times. <laughs> Very familiar. It's, it's not just a knock. It's not a knock on the door. It's a pounding, blasting on the door with bullhorns and everything else. Come out with your hands up. Yeah, I've been through it many times, Sean, so I get it. Before you drop to the floor and you time almost stands still, and they're all messed up, but you can see their eyes. Yes. The, the tension in their eyes. And you're thinking, if these guys open up with me right now, my life's gone in seconds. Gone. It's, it's a crazy feeling, isn't it? It sure is. Yes. My heart almost jumps out of my chest. They're like, get on the fucking ground now. Don't fucking move. Da -da 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 -da. So me and my girlfriend drop down. We're crushed. And there was two main detectives. One in particular was my nemesis. Later on, when I'm reading all the discovery these guys were sitting in Indian restaurants on the table next to me while I'm having food, eavesdropping all this shit, trailing me for like five years. And um, the nemesis finally gets in my face, yanks me up by the handcuffs. He's like, English Sean, you're a big name and we finally fucking got you. Now I'm just in my box of shorts. <laughs> now you start yelling at my girlfriend. I'm exercising my right to remain silent, love. I'm exercising my right to remain silent, love. And they're like, shut the fuck up. And I'm like, I'm exercising my right to remain silent, love. And they just grabbed me and like half throw me down the stairs. And that was the beginning then. We're processed by Tempe cops and sent over to Sheriff Joe Arpaio's Maricopa County Jail System where our 26 months I'm fighting the case and this is this then is raw survival of the fittest if you think the stories the stories I've said so far are dangerous but let me ask you this just straight out was it an informant that finally uh, turned on you or uh, you know accumulation of evidence it's always an informant so I'm just wondering in this case the same thing 
Yeah, there were 10 witness statements, and some were informants, some were people who'd been arrested for the Gravano enterprise, some were property owners in places Wildman had destroyed, because Wildman, he came and went three times, like I said, he was a menace to society, he got, him and Wild Woman got so hot, they ended up they were on the run and I had to rehouse them in Mexico. The people in Arizona said, wild man thinks he's tough. Does he doing all this shit in Arizona? If he tries that in Mexico, they'll fucking kill him. And the first house I put him in was blown up within days. And my guy went down there. He didn't have a phone. My guy went down there. We thought the Mexicans had killed him. But when, what we found out was wild man and wild woman, their relationship was based on domestic violence They'd got to that house first day, had a fight, a gas pipe had, had broke. And during the fight, they stopped to take a smoke break. And when they took a smoke break and lit up the fight, they saw a wall of blue flame. Blew up. And they just got out of the house in time before all the windows fucking exploded. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, so so um, wild man. Wildman's got many stories of houses being set on fire and blown up, not intentionally, just because of his crazy behavior. Yeah. So there was property, people whose properties had been destroyed by the wild ones, informants, Gravano enterprise people, and Skinner, my mm. top XC sales guy, was the guy who did the most damage. Now, wow. when Wildman came over the second time, in Wildman's absence, Skinner had become my closest friend. So, and Skinner was just a little guy. And he was like smoking crack and living out of a dumpster when I met him. I took him off the streets. He became my top sales guy, got a house, got a good woman. They had a kid. But when Wildman came over, I, and this is my best friend from childhood, then jealousy I get it. erupted. And Skinner made some power plays against me. One of them was when Wildman was in a deportation prison for almost a year, I think it was his second deportation, Skinner, who had been jealous of Wildman and the beef had been building up, Wild Woman was moving a lot of pills for me. She was living in Farmer in Tempe in an upstairs apartment and he had a crew of black gangsters. They came up with a scheme whereby a petrol bomb was flown thrown through her window, almost set her on fire, these gangsters showed up and said, look, we've come to save you. Get in the car, bring all of your pills. But they didn't know how tough Wild Woman was. I mean, to go out with Wild Man, to stab it's him. got to be crazy, right? Huh? Do all these things and have this relationship based on violence. This woman was incredibly tough. She was a tiny blonde woman, but you, they tough. didn't know what they were dealing with. So she comes out and she's like, who the fuck do you think you're fucking talking to? Do you think I just got off the fucking banana boat because I'm English and I'm top fucking liver? You want me to get in a car with you, motherfuckers? I've just been nearly set fire to. I don't know you fucking guys from Adam. And they just took off. They couldn't deal with her. <laughs> so Skinner, he thinks wild man's in this deportation camp. He can't get back into the country. I get a lawyer on the case. He expedites Wildman's release. Wildman gets back into the country. And then it's on between them two because Wildman, he's called Wild Woman from the deportation place saying, as soon as I get back, first thing I'm going to do is fucking kill Skinner. So he's high on crystal meth for days on end, not sleeping. We never allow him to have guns, but he's got multiple weapons. He finds Skinner's place. Skinner leaves the state after he snitched us out because he's so scared the Wildman. One of my other guys, Joey Crack, shows up at Skinner's place thinking Skinner's going to be in there. And Wildman's in there, and Joey Crack says, Wildman had every weapon known to man in that place laid out, like a screwdriver, a hammer, golf clubs, various knives. And as soon as Joey Crack entered, Wildman just grabbed him and, like, grabs a weapon. He's, he thinks he's Skinner. Wow. <laughs> so it was... Our inside guy that brought us down properly because he knew everything about us. The others Always happens. were blowing smoke just to try and reduce their own shit, especially the Gravano ones.
Always happens, you know, and eventually it's going to go down that way. Even after you're out of it a year, you know, they catch up with you. Well, I got to tell you, Sean, this was great. Uh, I mean it, you know, it, this is kind of like uh, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street meets the English guy, you know, it's, it's, a, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great story. It really is a fantastic story. And I'm glad you're doing well right now, though. It looks like you're getting back and I'm hoping these trolls, you know, go away because they shouldn't be able to shut anybody down when they're, you know, telling their stories and telling the truth. We're, we're dealing with that in a big way here in the States. It's terrible. And, uh, I hope people speak up enough and, and get rid of these tech giants that are able to censor us. It's terrible. Wall man does something crazy from the get-go that I'm going to tell you next time. Wallman signed a plea bargain after 12 months. So I'm fighting the case for 26 months. And I get moved from medium security to max security to super max. They're really fucking with me, the prosecutor, putting all this pressure on me. Later on, I'm completely separated from my co-defendants. But a guy comes into my life. Um, his book is up there. He's dead now. It's called The Mafia Philosopher, Two Tonys. He's an old-school mafia associate of the Bonanno crime family hmm. who worked under Joe Bonanno Sr. He didn't want me to ever give his real name out because of considerations right. to his family. So I, we, we called him Two Tonys. But he told me his life story, and he took me under his wing. And he, he, he mentored me. He, he was like a natural philosopher. He taught me all of these life lessons. And I'd like to, in the second part, in honor of him and Wildman, um, to get into the stories of, of, of them in the uh, incarceration sense. And if people are interested in what we've heard so far, my life story is a trilogy. So party time is everything that led to the SWAT team. Hard time is Arpaio's jail and prison time is DOC and what happens after that. Huge thank you to you, Michael, for coming on your channel. You've got, you know, massive following, highly respected. And I'd like to say to the young people watching this, don't get gangsteritis. It was two Tonys who taught me that expression, gangsteritis. He right. said, keep your day jobs, folks. You see the glitz, the glamour. I've, I've, I've been talking about it enthusiastically here, but I work in drugs education schools. And it's mostly the consequences that I concentrate on, the life lessons. When your mom flies 5,000 miles to visit you in an Arizona fucking slum house jail where she's waited outside for hours on end and they've had sniffer dogs on her ass and they're talking down to her, these redneck guards, and you see her bent over in that jail with her face broken because you fucking put yourself in there and she's out there so having your back still no matter what you've put her through. Think about the harm to your family, the harm you're causing society. It ends in the prison, police, and death. And I've never, ever claimed to be a gangster. People are calling me out saying that. Sean Atwood thinks he's a big guy, saying he's going up against Sammy the Bull. He's a tough guy. I mean, look at these hands. I've got piano playing hands. I'm a keyboard guy. I'm a, I'm a business nerd. Wildman was the big, tough guy. Not me. So I had gangsteritis myself and I lost six years of my life and I do yoga. I do meditation. I believe in karma and I'm trying to balance it out now by doing the right thing, working with the young people and helping people share their stories on my platform so they can rebuild their lives. Cause it was so cathartic to me to get the book out, to get the YouTube channel out, to tell my story and see all the love and responses coming in. It really helped me mentally adjust. I was a bit institutionalized when I got out. It helped me adjust. It's like those people, those strangers are there in spirit with you. So, yeah, huge thank you to the people watching this. And um, absolutely love what you do, Michael. Thank you again. Well, Sean, thank you. And I, I appreciate that message that you just sent out to everybody. It's something that I always try to leave my viewers with, you know, and speaking all over the world for the past 25 years, especially to our young people, you and I are on the same page that crime doesn't pay. Think of what it will do to your family, uh, because that's what we really have to consider. And uh, so I appreciate that very much. You keep up the great work. Uh, it was a tremendous uh, sit down that we had. So thank you again. Have a, uh, a, a brilliant rest of your evening. I think brilliant. That's the term you use all the time in the UK. <laughs>
you know, have a, a great rest of your evening. All right, take care, Mike. All Thank right, you. my friend, you take care. Thank you. Cheers. So there you have it, Sean Atwoods. Thank you again for all that you do and for all of you that are watching. And what do I say? How do I leave you all the time? Be safe, be healthy, God bless, and yes, I'll see you next time.